Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, thank you, everybody, for being here. I understand that I have a strong competitor that I have to top, uh, which is digestion. And uh, I will try and make my uh, presentation interesting, despite the fact that, that you will notice that there is a slight difference compared to the uh, speakers of this morning. This morning was about mainly uh, theoretical approaches to, uh, well, conspiracy, let's say. Uh, in my case, I will focus on the circulation or the adversarial information, uh, sometimes referred to as fake news, and I will adopt uh, a different approach. I am a sociologist. Uh, I am now a sociologist. Uh, I, I was trained as an economist, but you know, I tend to forget that. Um, and um, and I'm an, an empirical sociologist at that. And for several years, I've been studying uh, what is called sometimes digital labor, sometimes micro work, sometimes click work. You will see in a minute what I'm talking about. I would like to start this presentation uh, by putting a face on, uh, uh, you know, the fake news producers that we Hello, always talk about. Uh, somebody who uh, looks slightly different from the persons we are used to think about when we talk about uh, producers uh, fake news. Um, she is a, a click worker uh, from Bangladesh and she is actually uh, describing herself as a social media marketing expert who can sell you six million uh, clicks or views depending on the the platform you're on. Uh, now, of course, this is sometimes uh, uh, disconcerting to people who discover uh, the rich underground, well, not that underground, uh, economy uh, underlying fake news because we are used to think about fake news producers uh, as, you know, the characters that are described in the press as trolls. Usually they are Russian trolls, I mean, at least here in Europe. I spend some time in Taiwan and there all the trolls are Chinese. Uh, so each one is somebody else's troll, you know, and uh, and of course, I mean, uh, troll. I mean, this kind of character here involves uh, some kind of level of uh, um, you know uh, digital uh, proficiency or skills or high skills. You're supposed to be uh, quite of a hacker to do trolling, uh, to perform trolling uh, successfully. In other cases, the media also love to um, you know um, circulate narratives about fake news spread by bots, and bots, of course, is a very eluding concept, uh, which sometimes just suggests that you can automate some aspects of your uh, online communication. For instance, I mean, anybody has been trying at least once to, you know, to automate one, you know, a Facebook posting or tweeting by, you know, establishing that a certain tweet uh, will be uh, tweeted at a certain moment of the day. Um, are we bots nonetheless? I, well, I wouldn't say so, because especially when we talk about bots, we are somehow insisting or underlying uh, this kind of uh, myth that we can automate all aspects of our uh, present-day present day communication. And of course, when it comes to automation and fake news and the spread of fake news and other culprit is, uh, well, algorithms. Um, are algorithms. Uh, algorithms sometimes are described as the source of all evil uh, on social media. Uh, when everything bad happened around 2016 in the US, at least around the presidential elections, uh, the main target of criticism was Facebook uh, uh, trend, uh, trending algorithm, news trending algorithm. And of course, also, they are considered as a solution to these problems because uh, you know, you have a technical problem, at least it is described as such, and you have a technical solution. But another important way of uh, talking about fake news in the media is insisting on content creation. And there uh, the situation gets more complicated because you cannot automate everything and eventually it boils down to somebody writing down something which is blatantly false or extremely controversial. And yesterday's presentation, yesterday's talk was actually well, okay, let going in that direction because, of course, um, the person who was uh, uh, describing her experience as a, a former AFD, um, well, uh, content manager, basically, uh, was also insisting on the fact that they had to come up with text messages and spread this information and also, in some case, videos, but you had to create contents. I would like to say that uh, in the rest of my presentation, I will not focus specifically on content. I think that content uh, and focus on content is somehow misleading. We tend to focus on people who, are, uh, who have special skills, at least, 
skills in manipulation, skills in convincing others, uh, skills with language and a certain uh, cultural capital. But uh, fake news, uh, or at least the pillar of fake news, at least in my uh, own uh, experience as, again, uh, as, a, as a researcher uh, and in my, uh, based on my data, is another, is circulation. And circulation is, uh, well, another kind of, another type of game. Circulation is also about creating the right incentives for a certain message to be read. Like, for instance, when it comes to Facebook, which, again, is a, a, a platform that we all talk about probably too much because it's kind of the McDonald of uh, social platforms, for better or worse, well, for worse, basically. Uh, but uh, as you know, Facebook is mainly an advertising platform and everything is based on, uh, you know, uh, treating information as they were, as it were, ads, basically. And so when in 2016, basically, uh, the, uh, the, the Trump campaign uh, got a lot of traction, it was thanks to the kind of alignment of economic incentives that treated uh, misleading information about uh, or against, um, against uh, Hillary Clinton as ads, and these ads were circulated on Facebook, uh, well, basically by uh, people who were not the kind of sublime uh, text uh, writers or message writers uh, that we imagine, not the content creators, but persons like these young men from Veles in Macedonia, or I might say North Macedonia now. Um, so uh, there is an entire town a small uh, town in uh, Velas, a post-industrial town at that, where an entire generation of uh, teenagers, young adults, uh, eventually, uh, around 2016, invented a new profession, which was, well, a new job, which was basically spreading misinformation for Donald Trump, and they were not hired by Donald Trump's campaign. They were doing it because there was an alignment of uh, economic incentives on Facebook, meaning they could do money by spreading this controversial uh, fake news. Again, no connection uh, with Donald Trump. If you're looking for connection to, uh, with Donald Trump, well, you might go a little further, not in Macedonia, uh, but in Singapore, uh, where uh, people who were actively c working with uh, Donald Trump's campaign, uh, like this teenager, a 15 years old, a Singaporean student who was hired uh, by uh, Trump's campaign to produce uh, one or two uh, um, PowerPoint slides for presentation. So again, something smaller, something that did not demand a lot of skills, something that could be done quickly, and something that was negotiated on a specific specialized platform that is called Fiverr. Fiverr is one of the many platforms that exist on the web for people who describe themselves as freelancers, but they are, well, um, increasingly um, working as click workers, meaning doing something extremely limited in time, one, two minutes, it takes one, two minutes to, you know, perform these tasks like producing a slide, and they earn very little. Officially, Fiverr, the name seems to suggest, uh, starts with a, a $5 fee meaning that the minimum amount you can uh, earn is $5. And, uh, well, reality is a bit compl more complicated than that. You will see it in a minute. Fiverr is one of the platforms where you can actually buy click news content and circulation. I will be back that on that in a minute. Uh, another uh, famous one that was... It is, it, it is really controversial and uh, played a very important role in a scandal that you are all aware of, which is the Cambridge Analytical scandal, is another platform called Amazon Mechanical Turk. Have you ever heard about Amazon Mechanical Turk? Two persons, three, four, five, good, my God. I'm very lucky. Okay, Amazon Mechanical Turk is a platform where you actually can uh, as if you are uh, a requester, meaning you are a, a company or sometimes even an individual, you can publish what they called a hit, a human intelligence task. A human intelligence task is something that you are supposed to do quickly, intuitively, uh, sometimes it's just a click. You click on a button or you just give, I don't know, um, uh, I will give you in a second, you, uh, you give a word and you're paid 
well, a few cents usually. In this case, this was actually a task that was circulated on uh, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, write a news article for a new conservative news media. The news media uh, in question was called Goldwater, and the kind of word, uh, sorry, the kind of content they were looking for is uh, uh, first something like, you know, first lesbian bishop of Stockholm uh, boots Christ and welcomes Mohammed. Uh, I mean, along those lines. Um, and it was very well paid. Um, actually, I kind of remember, I don't see it here, but it was like $12 uh, and, uh, no, sorry, $5. But anyway, it, this is not exactly what happens on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Amazon Mechanical Turk is actually um, a platform uh, for uh, uh, very, very small tasks that uh, are paid very, a lot less than that. Uh, for those of you who never heard about Amazon Mechanical Turk, it was, it's a platform that was launched by, by uh, Jeff Bezos uh, back in 2006. It has nothing to do with Turkey as a nation. Uh, it actually has to do with this famous, uh, uh, well, robot, uh, the first so-called artificial intelligence designed in 1789 uh, 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 by um, um, an engineer, an Austrian engineer called von Kempelen. And this was supposed to be the first um, artificial intelligence because this uh, robot disguised as a Turkish gentleman was supposed to simulate uh, human cognitive uh, processes and challenge human chess players. Now, uh, there, there is a bit of a problem. It was actually a hoax. Somebody was hiding inside the robot, so the robot was not a robot, and this metaphor was willingly uh, recycled by Jeff Bezos, who blatantly said, uh, on Amazon Mechanical Turk, we do artificial, artificial intelligence. <laughs> and. Uh, Again, you are laughing now, but in a couple of slides, you will soon understand that uh, this is 90% uh, of the artificial intelligence we deal with today. Meaning by that, that if you go on Amazon Mechanical Turk, you can actually request or hire for a, a limited amount of time, again, a few minutes, uh, um, uh, thousands of people. Actually, they have like uh, 500,000 users in their user base. And the idea is that you can, I don't know, simulate an artificial intelligence by hiring small hands or small fingers or people who will click and impersonate an automatic process. It goes pretty much like this. Imagine that you are a company and you have, I don't know, millions of receipts like this one and you want to transcribe and tag it in order to for instance I don't know create a new search engine uh, that you know browse through all the information in that well first of all you need to tag all these images of receipts for for instance uh, is this transaction here that you see in this Walmart receipt about buying bananas or skis well somebody has to write down it is about bananas or it is about skis and a lot of this has to do with image tagging, too. And again, this is one of the typical uh, tasks that you can perform if you are a micro worker, or you are for a click worker on Amazon Mechanical Turk, you tag and uh, create squares around uh, you know, images of cars and, uh, and people and uh, traffic lights. And this is used to train well, I should not put brackets to train, um, for instance, a special kind of artificial intelligence, which is the one that uh, make uh, a, a, a self-driving car being self-driving. It is not entirely self-driving. Now, um, again, I won't insist on artificial, artificial intelligence, on, on, on the, you know, the fake part of it, but I, want, I will insist on one thing that has to do with fake news circulation, uh, which is basically that these people who, are, who accept to be on Amazon Mechanical Turk and on other platforms are basically performing piecework. Uh, piecework, meaning that they are paid by the task, they are not hired, they do not have a job, they do not have a formal employment, they can be hired and fired uh, in a click again. And look at the kind of pay they receive. It's not five nor twelve dollars, it's actually something around one, two, three cents. And again, you might say, oh my God, this is horrifying, wait for it, there is, uh, this is supposed to be like the top of the micro-working uh, platforms. There are platforms that pay you a lot less than that. 
Interestingly enough, the first question that everybody asks me whenever I try and explain uh, how MicroWorks works, um, they say, okay, who accepts to be paid once, one cent, two cents? Well, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk has a user base made up of 65% of American citizens, so there are people in the US who are interested in performing this kind of PS work. The rest is basically uh, Indian citizens. Uh, and again, okay, oh, this is seems more reasonable. Again, India is not uh, is not a, a low income country. It's an emerging country with a rich and thriving uh, tech uh, industry. With places like Bangalore and Hyderabad, who are the Silicon Valleys uh, of India, or one might say that Silicon Valley is the Hyderabad of uh, of the U.S. But anyway, uh, again, there are people who accept to be paid that little. In some cases, uh, the fact that you have so many American citizens on Amazon Mechanical Turk, well, can be leveraged and weaponized to circulate fake news. Meet Alexander Kogan. Uh, I suppose that you are not familiar with his name, especially because he changed his name, and I kid you not, he changed his name from Kogan to Spectre. So he's now his name is Alexander Spectre, like the ghost. And uh, this uh, researcher at Cambridge University created a company that you're probably not familiar with called SCL, Strategic Communication Lab, but you are probably familiar with the American branch of this SCL company, which is called Cambridge Analytica. And now we go back in a loop to our fake news topic. Because what happened with the Cambridge Analytica scandal, and I suppose that you're all aware of that, is that uh, uh, Facebook took a lot of hit for that. Sorry, heat in terms of a lot of uh, uh, criticism. But the problem is that uh, the Cambridge Analytica debacle was a combination of, well, uh, Amazon, Mechanical Turk, and Facebook, uh, they go together. Um, what happened is that basically uh, SCL slash Cambridge Analytica hired or re recruited people on Amazon Mechanical Turk to answer a psychological profiling questionnaire. And then they used that as a, a front or let's say as an excuse for the people who were recruited, and we're talking about 12,000 people, uh, recruited on Amazon Mechanical Turk to download an app that would eventually whisk and uh, uh, download all their Facebook contacts. And this created, of course, the first basis of several, uh, well, 100,000, no, sorry, 300,000 uh, uh, people who eventually, uh, in a snowball kind of situation, uh, built up to be, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, a 3 million, um, uh, sorry, 50 million um, user base that was used uh, uh, for profiling purposes in the Cambridge Analytica scandals. Uh, again, when the, uh, well, the, the, the public opinion, internationally speaking, discovered that uh, there was a big scandal, but this is something that in my uh, field of research, uh, again, uh, digital labor and click work is not new at all. Actually, what happened is something that is described as uh, uh, astroturfing, actually, which means uh, 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 you know, you crowd uh, some people to perform small tasks. In this case, they were supposed to uh, provide contacts. And then you use those to circulate and spread information to people who are not willing participants in your own uh, psychological, little psychological um, um, uh, experiment. And again, the point is who are those people who spread uh, these fake news who, who are willing to participate in this kind of, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, adversarial information production. Uh, when it comes to uh, um, uh, digital labor platforms, ones like, you know, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk or Fiverr, they have, um, well, a way of describing themselves as, uh, you know, data with a human touch. Again, they, 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 they kind of put this, this front. And again, uh, let's not focus on the message. Let's focus on the image. Iconography is very important. Uh, and they tend to use as front persons, persons who do not resemble their actual micro workers. 
this person here is very blonde, very white. Uh, their micro workers are people who are somehow recruited in countries uh, like Philippines, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan. And when we actually look at the geography of micro work and in general of digital labor, well, we bump into uh, you know maps such as this. This map was produced in, back in 2013. Uh, by my colleagues at the Oxford University, uh, Oxford uh, Internet Institute, uh, uh, Mark Graham and Willi de Donverta. And uh, uh, just to give you an idea of what's described here, of course, each circle represents a country. Bigger circles means that these countries either buy or sell microwork. And if you want to know who sells microwork, so where are the microworkers, where are the, the click workers, just look at the red of these circles. The redder the circle, the more you have microworkers in it. And the pinker, uh, the, surfer, the circle, sorry, uh, it, that means that you, these are countries that buy, that buy microwork, that basically means that they recruit people to perform this kind of click work. So who are the countries, oh, who were back in 2013, countries who uh, hired, requested, recruited microworkers? USA, Canada, Great Britain, France, and Australia. And uh, who are the countries? Where are microworkers? Where were microworkers in 2013? India, Philippines, Bangladesh, Pakistan, China, Russia, Ukraine, and Poland. Things have changed since then, uh, importantly because you have a, a lot of non-English speaking platforms that uh, you know popped up. And so now you have very big players that were not mapped back in 2013. For instance, uh, most countries in Africa, such as Madagascar, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, and Tunisia, who are now big microworkers providers, and interestingly enough, but it will not come as a surprise for you, um, countries like Venezuela, who are now extremely uh, prominent, prevalent, hegemonic almost, uh, in terms of uh, um, microwork production, in terms of uh, uh, the work, these are, these, Venezuela is the place where microworkers live now. Uh, how does the circulation of fake news and uh, of adversarial information work uh, on the internet in general? You basically have two types of modes of circulation. One is a, a hierarchical pyramid uh, shaped one, which basically means that you have a customer, usually it can be for instance, uh, I don't know, a company or a, a party or some kind of political institution too, uh, that is the client at the top that uh, uh, uses an agent, an intermediary, a broker to recruit uh, information leaders, this could be, for instance, I don't know, Instagram influencers or Twitter influencers, and these influencers eventually have an army of workers that actually perform the dirty job of circulating the news by simply clicking, sharing on Facebook, liking, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, this kind of uh, uh, structure was the one that eventually led to Duterte's election, or at least was instrumental uh, in Duterte's election in the Philippines, as attested by this report produced uh, by uh, my colleagues uh, Jonathan Colpers Ong and uh, Jason Vincent uh, Cabanes. Pardon, sorry. Uh, and uh, but this is not the only kind, the only type of uh, circulation. There is another one, which is uh, basically a one too many. Uh, where you have the same customer, again imagine a, uh, um, a party, and this party can simply through a platform like Amazon Mechanical Turk or others recru recruit, uh, request uh, hundreds of thousands and in some cases also millions of people who are click workers. It looks like this. You basically buy likes. You buy likes, you buy shares, you buy many things, you buy fans. Uh, again, uh, somebody that you all know very, very well, uh, Donald Trump, uh, is known uh, for, well, having done this uh, back in 2016, where eventually the number of fans of his Facebook page increased overnight. By overnight, I mean from one hour to the other. And interestingly enough, uh, after this uh, big increase in the number of fans, we also discovered that the, the, let's say, geography of his fans is, was kind of funny. funny. Uh, okay, yeah, you have, uh, again, a lot of people coming from the Philippines. This is a major uh, constituency. And then the second one is Mexico, which is ironic, given the enormity of the things he said and done, has done to Mexico since then. 
Now, um, again, in some cases, these people work from home, uh, meaning that they are equipped and connected enough to you know, have uh, uh, the possibility of working from their laptop or even their smartphone in some cases. In other cases, in, in certain countries, we have uh, what we call click farms. And uh, these click farms are actually brick and mortar structures that 有些人看我的视频没有点赞就离开了，可有些人还没看完，随手就是一个赞，因为他们知道每个人都不容易，随手一个赞就是对年轻人最大的鼓励。如果你也是，and actually you know can click on things. Okay, this is a a typical uh, Chinese click farm again. I was in Taiwan, this is why I, uh, I, I insist a lot on uh, the Chinese uh, you know, click farmers again. China is not the only place. We have click farms everywhere and we have click workers everywhere and some of those click workers do a lot of fake news circulation work. Um, interestingly enough, yeah, okay, you see here the kind of working condition. This woman is working in a very uh, cold place because of uh, servers and because of the equipment. Uh, so she's wearing a heavy coat and she has some kind of gloves and uh, uh, with a chair, uh, she moves uh, quickly, swiftly from one uh, um, uh, screen to the other and clicks on, well, not random information. She has a certain um, task, a certain number of tasks that she has to perform in order, for instance, uh, for one information to be better ranked in, a, a, I don't know, a search engine or to be, uh, to, to reach a certain level of uh, circulation of viewership. It can be, I don't know, uh, a YouTube video. Uh, whenever you see sometimes YouTube videos, uh, uh, you know, conspiracy theory YouTube videos with two million views, Yes, we have to assume that we have two million people who actually believe in the outrageous things that they are said in those videos, but some of those are also uh, fake clicks, basically, or uh, the, produ the product of click work. So again, how do we buy click works? And I would like to finish with this, just to give you an idea of how poorly these people are paid and how it is important to actually think about their working conditions in order to uh, counter fake news circulation. Okay, the idea is that you can go, uh, I don't know, on resellers, uh, platforms such as these, which eventually will bring you to other uh, uh, companies like this one that will sell you, I don't know, in this case, Instagram followers. You can either buy active or passive Instagram followers. Of course, active followers means that they can actually react to what you say, and they cost a lot compared to the passive ones who are not very expensive. We are talking about really a, a work that is considered extremely cheap and de-skilled. And despite this, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of people who performed it, uh, for instance, who perform it in, in countries such as uh, France, uh, you know, for, to give you an idea of how, um, how much a French click worker is paid. Here is an example taken from actually the socialist uh, campaign uh, in 2017, uh, they were inviting people to vote in the primaries, okay? And uh, as you see, uh, each click is paid 70 cents of a euro, okay? So you say, it's, it's not a lot. Well, brace yourself, because the, uh, the more you go east, the less, the least you're paid. Uh, um, so, that's give you an idea. Uh, if you go to Russia, it's, we're talking about 48 kopecks, which in my estimates is seven cents of a dollar. I, I'm, I want to be corrected if I'm wrong, please. But uh, uh, again, wait for it. Let's go to Pakistan, where uh, a click is paid 0 .0, 0 0.06 cents, not a dollar. We're talking about 0 0.06 cents for a share on Facebook. And if you go to Indonesia, uh, and uh, you want to buy, for instance, Instagram followers, uh, each, uh, sorry, Instagram likes, each like is actually paid 0 0.008 cents. Again, this has to do with the average uh, wage level of 
each of those countries. This has also to do with the fact that we are actually facing a micro workforce, a clique workforce that is unaccounted for and that has a role to play, especially if we consider those as exploited workers. Because in many cases, according to existing evidence, and there is an increasing body of evidence, these people are in, let's say, they are performing um, a, a type of work that cannot be construed as free. Uh, they have some kind of uh, uh, constraints that force them in this kind of situation. And, uh, uh, and so I would like to finish with uh, uh, not one takeaway message, but actually a set of takeaway messages. And the first one is that despite the emphasis on bots, on automation of the circulation of fake news, uh, uh, the viral circulation of news on social platform is the crux of the information manipulation problem. Again, let's not focus uh, exclusively on the content of cons conspiracy videos or conspiracy posts. Let's focus on the enormous amount of likes and shares that this uh, uh, information receives. And the secret ingredient of that circulation, of this success, of this visibility, actually, of this uh, vocal minority is digital labor. It's actually the labor that is negotiated and bought and accounted for on um, platforms like the one that I've been talking about. And digital labor can be described as a taskified, meaning reduced to small tasks and underpaid human labor, not uh, automatic process. It's human labor performed by millions of click workers and uh, this is actually the secret ingredient of this viral circulation. And to fight against this, we have to probably adopt, let's say, creative strategies that in some case, well, first of all, uh, involve uh, recognizing uh, the invisible workforce that circulates this information, and uh, also to come up with the ideas and, uh, and policy measures to protect them socially speaking, politically speaking, economically speaking, because recognizing and providing them with better pay, better working condition, can actually also provide them with more rights, including the rights to say no to this kind of uh, dangerous and uh, extremely controversial tasks, such as, um, um, such as face, fake news circulation. So the possibility to refuse malicious tasks, imagine you are a a Mexican click worker and you are, you know, offered the possibility to click and become a fan of Donald Trump, if you can refuse it, this is something that in terms of your rights is important, in terms of your own, well, livelihood and well-being in the future is probably another good uh, thing. So by giving click workers voice against propaganda-related projects, we are also uh, helping counter this kind of fake news circulation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonio. That was a wonderful talk. And I, I love the way you gave faces to the people who are helping generate fake news. I guess I have uh, two questions about your abstraction from content, which I take the point of. Uh, one is that a lot of research needs to be done on what's going on with social media, with Twitter and other things. And my understanding is that a lot of sociologists actually rely on the Mechanical Turk to do research. So this is uh, a hybridized human machine co-evolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just wanted to say that I think we're kind of stuck with that uh, on either side. The other thing I want to say is that um, there are also a lot of digital labor people involved in trying to deal with really horrific content. Um, in particular, Human Rights Watch people, I'm thinking of Alexa Koenig, who just got a MacArthur Award at uh, the UC Berkeley Law School. So she trains, she crowdsources and trains her undergraduates very, very carefully in how to reconstruct the evidence of maybe what happened on a corner in homes in Syria. People are risking their lives, uploading very horrible images in an effort to retain or construct some kind of merit narrative in the future. And European laws now mandate that after 24 hours, something very horrible has to be taken down. And Alex is really worried because people have risked their lives for that. But there's a huge digital labor issue, it seems to me, in protecting workers and training them properly 
to handle this kind of horrific imagery. Um, and I don't know whether I quite agree automation alone, there's this myth of the algorithm doing everything. But um, maybe some of this click work will be automated in the future. And so this is an open-ended invitation to respond to that as the next step. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for, for those two questions. Quickly on the fact that so as social scientists, sometimes we rely on platforms such as Amazon Mechanical Turk. I would like to say, and again, this is not discipline bashing, that it's mainly social psychologists, not so sociologists as such. Because, no, again, it's not discipline bashing. It's actually, uh, it has to do with the kind of history of a discipline, uh, and I know that Barbara will say something probably about that. Uh, uh, history of a discipline and relying, for instance, in the past on uh, students, and now you can rely also on Amazon Mechanical Turkers. The point is that, again, this is something that is extremely uh, visible but not prevalent in terms of who are the requesters on Amazon Mechanical Turk. But Amazon Mechanical Turk is just a drop in the sea of uh, micro work in general. We have a, a rough estimate over 100 million people performing micro work all over the world because they are big China uh, platforms, Chinese platforms such as Chubajie or TaskCN, probably never heard of, of them, but they, are, they have each 18 million, 15 million micro workers each. Uh, and they are not exactly, I mean, they are, they are, they are several uh, orders of magnitude over the 500,000 people who are on, micro, on, on the Amazon Mechanical Turk. Amazon Mechanical Turk is uh, visible because it's Amazon, but it's just, again, just a drop in the sea. Um, when it comes to the other uh, question, and I thank you very much for that because this allows me to say that, uh, again, uh, in some cases, uh, micro work is the well, it's a secret ingredient of circulation or of uh, adversarial information, but it, it is also actively used uh, by the same platforms, actually, uh, for moderation purposes. Commercial content moderation relies heavily on the same kind of platforms. You go on, you know, uh, big, big platforms and you hire uh, 100,000 people who will watch all day long decapitation videos or child abuse videos on uh, Facebook and YouTube and remove them to filter, to ban them and so on and so on. Despite the fact that, again, platforms such as Facebook and recently uh, there, there, there is a lot of controversy about that, insist on the fact that yeah, in the future everything will be automated and we will not need these people who, as of today, are exposed to danger, dangerous content in itself because what does it do to your mind actually looking at extremely disturbing images all day long? Uh, well, in some cases, we have had in the past cases of uh, uh, micro-workers and content moderators uh, who sued uh, uh, companies such as Microsoft for PTSD uh, induced by their moderation work. And, uh, and again, but uh, I think that the best thing I could do is simply suggesting you a, a splendid book that was just published uh, in, uh, uh, at the Yale University Press by Sarah Roberts, who is the undisputed expert on commercial content moderation, and the, the title of the book is Behind the Screen. It was published like two weeks ago. Um, so uh, again, this is the place where you will actually find a lot of evidence because she, she is a, a, well, she, she is a, an empiricist herself, so she's been doing a lot of field work on that. Fantastic. Uh, I'm unclear on your final recommendations. Mm -hmm. You say that click workers should have the right to refuse, um, but aren't they doing it, well, at least in theory, voluntarily, that is, they offer themselves for the job, and second, wouldn't refusing um, blackball them? Um, wouldn't they, if they w would gain a reputation of refuser, wouldn't they simply be unemployable? Mm -hmm. okay. So first of all, the voluntary aspect, mm -hmm. and second, protection for those who refuse. Okay. Again, um, when it comes to um, what are the motivations that push people to uh, perform uh, click work, uh, I think that uh, one thing that is clear, at least for my several years of study in this uh, 
uh, this kind of uh, social phenomenon, phenomenon is that the economic motivation is paramount. Uh, we, interview, we, we, we just performed the, like, the, 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 the first and only so far um, uh, um, French microworkers survey and uh, 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 the, the vast majority of our respondents said that they were doing it for the money. So these, in some cases, like, I don't know, European and US microworkers is uh, uh, a work that is performed to have a complementary uh, income, but a complementary income that is also necessary as of today because of many, many economic reasons and precarity and, uh, you know, vulnerability of uh, certain uh, strata of the population. Um, so, uh, again, is it free? Um, well, given the lack of alternatives, uh, it is not entirely free. In some countries, again, think about Madagascar or Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, Madagascar is a place where, for instance, the average wage as of 2017 per month was 40 euros. If you can earn 40 euros by working from home, performing any kind of tasks, from the most mundane to the most horrifying ones, you would do it. Again, how free are you? when you accept or refuse this. Well, that regardless of context. Well, again, uh, another point is that uh, my recommendation in terms of protect, protecting their rights is also part of a larger effort by me and many colleagues and some uh, unions and, uh, and uh, policy institutions, uh, policy bodies, sorry, uh, to help microworkers organize and organize in order to have their rights as workers recognized and among those to have the right to say something about the content so that in the future we will not say regardless of content. I will accept or not to perform this work only if I can actually uh, know, for instance, who is requesting it, who is requiring it, and, who, uh, and what is the final purpose of it. We have been interviewing, to give you an example, for our French uh, survey, people who were hired to train racist video games meaning a video game that you, know, you, you see somebody with a French name uh, go closer to this person, you see somebody uh, with an uh, Arab name uh, move away from this person. Again, having to not only to refuse but to know exactly the final aim, the final purpose of such video games is something that is extremely important and that it can be construed as a, 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 an issue of, uh, of uh, organizing and you know, providing rights and respecting rights of these workers. Yes, but social protection in this case, yes. Okay, I have four more people on my list. Oh, and wow. In the interests of time, I will close the list here. So the next question is in the back, all the way in the back, all the way in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for this pretty pretty shocking and horrifying talk. <laughs> but Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> 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 I really have never seen anything like it. Um, I, I, I'm wondering so who who are the people that are running these kinds of click farms? Who, who, who are the, I, I don't even know if they're business people exactly, mm -hmm. but who, who operates these, mm -hmm. these kind of middle spaces? Okay. Okay, uh, first of all, this allows me, uh, thank you, uh, this allows me um, uh, for, for, I mean, um, well, gives me the opportunity to, to make it, to, to actually differentiate between uh, platforms and click farms. Sometimes there is, they, they intermingle, they overlap, uh, but if we consider like the pure uh, platform and the pure click farm, they are two pretty distinct uh, and different uh, phenomena. A platform is basically, you know, uh, either a startup or a company. So again, it's uh, business oriented uh, and people who actually come up with the idea of creating a platform, even if it's just a platform to sell likes on Instagram, are business minded uh, persons. Either they are in, uh, uh, again, uh, the Northern Hemisphere countries or uh, they are in emerging countries or in, uh, uh, in uh, developing ones. But again, uh, they, are, they consider themselves as entrepreneurs. Uh, and businessmen. Uh, when it comes to click farm, it probably gets more complicated, and I'm uh, actually relying on the, uh, the work of a, a, a colleague, an anthropologist, uh, a Swedish anthropologist called Johan Lindqvist, uh, who has been studying uh, click farms in Indonesia in particular. 
and uh, uh, in his um, uh, field work, he has discovered that many of those click farms were actually kind of uh, uh, workers' re-intermediation initiatives. For instance, I am a worker, I have been click working for several years, I discover that I can simply, you know, set up a click farm in uh, uh, the garage of my, <coughs> well, or in some cases, a room of my apartment. Uh, or I can, uh, I don't know, use a cyber cafe, creating some kind of partnership with a cyber cafe where I put uh, 50 persons and this person's click all day long. And these places are extremely interesting because they are informal, they change a lot from day to day, and interestingly enough, the only uh, uh, automation that I have been personally witnessing uh, is in places such as this, meaning that this kind of uh, workers who, uh, you know, uh, one day discover that it can be businessmen too and create a click farm, sometimes they say, okay, let's do it quickly, quickly, quickly. And so let's create some short and small and quick and dirty routines. I'm talking about, uh, uh, you know, um, in, um, computer uh, routines. You know, they, they create, the, they copy and paste some, some lines of code from an existing uh, program and they come up with their own bot. And this is where bots come from. Uh, so you see two different type of uh, um, um, uh, gigs, let's say. Uh, the platform being the more presentable one in some cases, and the click farm being the kind of grassroots, let's say, one. Anyone? Yeah. I raised my hand? Yes. Oh, no, okay. I think, no, I think I didn't. You were but shaking. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, if I have a spot, then I'll use it. <laughs> um, I was wondering if um, the fact that this knowledge is seeping in, um, in other words, knowledge of, uh, knowledge of these practices. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, myself, I didn't know maybe six, seven years ago, I didn't know that you could hire people mm -hmm. to do likes. I naively believed they were uh, genuine. Okay. And then, you know, you come to learn that these can be mechanical. Mm -hmm. So that must create um, a new way of disregarding or dismissing the information, mm -hmm. or a lot of it, or a lot of information that you see on the internet. And uh, so I was wondering if what is your sense? Because, uh, l you know, this is what we are trying to understand, how much information or the credibility of it is unsettled by these new technologies. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to me that as we understand more and more how it works, mm -hmm. then we simply be disbelieve everything mm -hmm. more and more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what is your take on it? Okay. Um, it is extremely interesting because this uh, is also one way for me to, let's say, let's introduce some nuance. I presented you with the evidence for how the process of fake news circulation starts. The end result is something of a mixed bag between uh, fake followers and fake likes and what you describe as genuine people. Uh, they are called uh, organic users. You know, me and you, <laughs> yeah. Uh, again, this uh, <laughs> again uh, platform platform uh, and especially social media uh, bullshit talk. It's a, it's a, it's a genre in itself. Okay, organic people uh, they co <laughs> they coexist with uh, uh, with uh, fake uh, likes and. Uh, the French have a way of saying that uh, uh, fake likes and fake followers are the amorce de pompe, which in English I think is pump priming, something like this. I mean, you, you start pumping water with this and then the rest, well, it's done by you and me. Again, imagine all the kind of, what would be your reaction? What is your reaction? I mean, your mind. Uh, whenever we see, I don't know, a message that has been already circulated by two million people, we at least you devote a bit of attention to it. And this is the point. Uh, two million people is the, uh, the, the, the sign, the signal of uh, a message that you cannot uh, dismiss. And when it comes to disregarding information, as you were saying, this plays in, not in terms of creating disbelief, but on the contrary of attracting attention and creating attention. And in an attention economy, uh, this is extremely important. So it uh, doesn't matter if you consider at the end 
uh, after reading this message, message that has been already been spread by two million people that you will not believe it and you find it not relevant, you have been watching it. In terms of eyeball count, that counts. Amber. Thank you for this completely fascinating and completely horrifying Thank you. Uh, talk. Um, I also wanted to ask you about your recommendations at the end because it sounded, um, in a, to put it in a caricatured way, mm -hmm. like you were saying, so what we need to do is solve destitution and existential vulnerability all over the world mm -hmm. and we'll be fine. I'm sorry, I didn't get what you say. Uh, I, I solve, yeah. solve, eliminate destitution yeah, yeah, and yeah, existential yeah, vulnerability yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. all over the world. I'm sorry, I'm afraid and, that, that, and that we'll I'm that fine. Marxist. No, no, I'm not <laughs> against the project. I just am very pessimistic about it being realized. Um, and of course, the, the longer that the situation goes on, the further we are from realizing it since it's creating the impediment to mm -hmm. that very end. Um, and I wondered whether, I mean, should I really feel completely hopeless or are there other intervention points at different levels yes. that at least might help get traction mm -hmm. on the problem? Sure. Because getting China to be a state that can't exploit, say, incarcerated labor you agree, can't uh, yes. be the, yes, yes, the, yes. the necessary sure. means if sure, we're going sure. to achieve it. China or Russia or even Finland, I mean, these countries have been known uh, as of reason to have been to, to, to use uh, um, uh, people in uh, uh, prisons, actually, to perform click works. And in some cases, we also have evidence of click workers in uh, refugee camps uh, in, uh, in the Middle East, in some countries. Now, uh, again, when I, uh, you, you rightly say, okay, probably that this is a, a moonshot to say that we have to resolve destitution and eliminate destitution in order to resolve this problem with, with uh, fake news. Uh, and I understand and I agree with you that it is a, a, a long-term goal. Uh, again, probably uh, I, I should have said that uh, my proposal, which is not only mine, let's say mine and one of the, and the proposal of those who have been studying it and insist on workers' organization and, and protection, social protection, and so, um, we insist on that as opposed to other policies. Other policies so far, especially in Europe, go in another direction. And the other direction is basically that uh, in order to uh, eliminate fake news, you have to put in prison fake news producers or fake news circulators, which is problematic in itself because of the many things we have said this morning, and to an extent I can agree with Ilya, I, uh, yes, I see it over there, that we are all uh, conspiracy theorists, but in a sense that we all, in a way, uh, are uh, involved accessories to this kind of system. As organic users, we find ourselves at each day in a situation where we at least look at this content, and this counts, again. Uh, again, the, the idea that has been, uh, uh, I mean, they've been trying it in Germany, they are trying it in France, uh, and in other countries too, is that whenever we have somebody producing fake news or circulating fake news, first of all, you have to pay, if you are uh, considered guilty of that, 70, uh, uh, 75,000 euros in, uh, in fines, and you can risk one year in prison. I am not sure that this kind of repressive approach will uh, have some results. And so the idea is let's try another thing in creative uh, political and economic incentives that will allow these people to refuse uh, uh, this kind of work and uh, in a way uh, kind of uh, diffuse uh, the entire system that is based on click work and micro work, at least when it comes to this kind of tasks. Thank you very much. You just answered my question. This was the last question I had to. Good. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have another final short question from Diana. Your suggestion of how to find whoever is at the top and is demanding these things makes me think, and if it was very difficult for finding secret societies or con contract, you know, complex <coughs> societies that end up in the Cayman Islands mm -hmm. for banking, I can't imagine how you would ever get to the original demanders of anything in something as complex as mm -mm -mm. black internet or black net. So can you please en enlighten me as to how one can actually ever find okay. the beginners? 
first of all, I, I am not sure we can characterize this as a black internet or dark or dark net, you know. Uh, a dark net is, an, is another thing. These are uh, uh, legit initiatives. Even the click farms, uh, you can actually see them. The French have a very good way of s describing this kind of work as, well, th there is, uh, okay, some of you know the Le, le Poinçonneur de Lila. Uh, which is a song from the 1960s, which is a song of somebody who, you know, checks your tickets. You meet this guy every day and you do not see him, okay? These are the poinçonneurs de l'IA, which means the, 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 the clickers the, of, of this kind of economy. You see, it every, you see them every day and you do not recognize them. This is not because they are invisible. This is not because this is black labor or a dark economy. This is because there is some kind of effort from us not to recognize those as workers. When it comes to their requesters, meaning the people who hire them, it gets even more complicated because it, from their part, meaning the requesters' part, there is an active uh, effort not to be uh, recognized for many reasons. In some cases, because what they do is clearly shady or morally reprehensible or can expose them to, to some kind of liability. And in other cases, because this also has to do uh, with uh, um, the kind of uh, cognitive biases that can be introduced by the fact that you know who is hiring you to perform a certain task. Uh, politically speaking, it can you know, backfire. Hmm? And also, if you are not a, a requester that does political communication or information, but you are, for instance, a company that just wants to automate some processes, in some cases, this kind of cognitive bias can play against you. And in some cases, there are also some kind of industrial secret uh, issues that play into that. So it's extremely difficult to find who these requesters are and in my opinion, at least this is kind of a, a research program for us as researchers in this field it, for the future. We, we are starting to have a lot of evidence about the click workers. We know relatively little about the requesters and this is something that we have to do in the future. And I stop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio, for bringing empirical reality. In.